Good evening. Thank you all for braving the cold and coming out tonight. Good evening and welcome to the Ford Museum. My name is Kristen Mooney and I'm the Public Affairs Specialist for both the Library and Museum. And it's my pleasure to welcome you this evening. Tonight's program is brought to you by the National Archives and Records Administration with additional support from the Ford Presidential Foundation. We are very grateful for the foundation and all of you who are members of the Friends of Ford program. It's your ongoing support that makes possible our feature exhibits, research travel grants, and educational activities and events like tonight. Before we get started, um, I'd like to ask that you silence your cell phones and turn off any other electronic devices, and I'll be in the booth later to make the echo stop. <laughs> Prior to introducing our speaker, I'd like to provide you with a few information about some upcoming events and exhibits. In Grand Rapids, our holiday tradition continues with the former train shown at the Breton Village Mall. New additions this year include Congressman Ford's Quonset Hunt, the Patland Hotel, the Fort Painted Varnish Company, as well as the Big Top Cervicus. Many thanks to our countless volunteers who made this display possible. It's truly a delight. As a gift to the city, the museum and the train will be free during Christmas break this year. So mark your calendars December 23rd through, July, um, through January 5th and bring your children down and grandchildren as well. Looking ahead, our next featured visit, exhibit will be the continual struggle and that's images by Brian Washington. The exhibit depicts the pain, sacrifice, and emotion of those who fought for freedom during the civil rights movement. It includes 23 images and they will be on display upstairs. In Ann Arbor, we have some modern quilts and traditional quilts decorating the lobby for the holiday season. Those will be up through January. And opening later this month is Extraordinary Circumstances. And that's going to be a reprise of the exhibit that was on display here. So if you missed it in Grand Rapids, feel free to head over to Ann Arbor and you'll be able to see it there. Handouts are available outside as well as a survey about tonight's program. If you didn't grab one, feel free to do so and let us know how we're doing. And now on to tonight's program. It is a pleasure to welcome Mary Evans Seely to our stage. Mrs. Seely is a collector, historian, lecturer, author, and publisher of two books about White House Christmases. She and her husband, Ron, who is here tonight as well, have the most extensive collection of presidential Christmas memorabilia in the country. Parts of the Seely collection have been on display at various presidential libraries. And if you recall, we had part of her collection here when we showed the White House in miniature. Encouraged by White House curator Rex Scouten to write season's greetings, Mrs. Seely visited presidential libraries and birthplaces, met with various presidents and first ladies, including our own Betty Ford. She received communications from Lady Bird Johnson, the Clinton White House, and also the office of Melania Trump. Her book, Season's Greetings, is now in its eighth and final edition. It tells stories of Christmas from the White House from President Coolidge through President Trump documenting nearly a century of presidential Christmases. We are in for a true treat this evening. Please join me in welcoming Mary to our stage. Many people have uh, apologized for bringing us from Florida to uh, <laughs> Michigan weather. But in a way, it's very nostalgic. You know, I'll be home for Christmas. Ron and I are both from the Midwest. I'm from Wisconsin. He grew up in Nebraska. So it's, it's kind of a nostalgic time for us to come back, uh, even though our parents are gone. Uh, but it is a pleasure for us to be here tonight. So. Thank you. It has, as Kristen said, it has been my honor and privilege to be able to have an interview or interaction with eight of the first ladies in the writing of my book, Season's Greetings from the White House. And that's a big step for a farm girl from Wisconsin. Mrs. Ford was one that I interviewed and she was very gracious 
very uh, down to earth and open. We had a delightful visit. And there are four key words that I remember from that Ford interview. One was family, a family that skis together, stays together. Another is familiar. The Fords had the advantage of being in Washington 25 years before they went to the White House. So they were very familiar with what, with what goes on in the White House. Another was fun. Mrs. Ford said, when I go to the White House, I want to make it fun. And then the fourth is favorite. She shared with me her favorite Christmas in the White House. And also, one of my favorite stories in the whole book comes from the Ford administration. It was the gift print of 1976, um, the background of which Mrs. Ford was not familiar. And so I shared it with her, and I'll share it with you a little bit later uh, in my talk. So Ron and I are honored to be here as part of your Christmas celebration at the Ford Museum. We had a chance to walk around this afternoon. You did a wonderful job. And uh, presidential libraries are just a treasure of history. And um, I hope you appreciate it. I'm sure you do. And you can get to other presidential libraries uh, as well. To begin with, I want to give you a little background of Christmas in the White House. You know, George Washington did not live in the White House. He lived in New York. But he started a tradition of New Year Eve, um, of New Year's Day receptions. And uh, that New Year's Day reception was carried forth by John Adams when he moved to the White House in 1801. And that started uh, this, a social custom in the nation's capital. And everyone could go to uh, shake hands with the president on New Year's Day. From the common folk to the highest ranking diplomat, they were welcome, but they were scheduled in the, in the order of their prominence. So diplomats and government officials were first, and then came the military. And by 1930, the crowds grew to more than 6,000 men, women, and children standing in line on January 1st. So um, it was not Christmas, but it was a New Year's Day reception. That was the major event in the social life of Washington for 130 years. From 1801 until 1932, when the Hoovers had enough and they went on vacation, a holiday <laughs> vacation. John Coolidge told me when I interviewed him, he said that his mother's hands became so swollen that her gloves had to be cut off uh, after the reception. In early America, uh, Christmas was a regular work day. It was not until after the Civil War that Christmas became a federal holiday during the Grant administration. And then a decade later, in 1879, Christmas cards were introduced in America by uh, Louis Prang, a, a German uh, card um, maker. Then a dec decade later, Benjamin Harrison introduced the first Christmas tree. Frances Cleveland added electric lights to the joy of her grandchildren. And 20 years later, President Wilson requested that a Christmas tree be placed on the Capitol grounds in 1913. And then 10 years after that, it was the director of the DC public schools that suggested erecting a um, Christmas tree on White House grounds and having the president come and light the tree. So Calvin Coolidge was the first president to light the national Christmas tree. That is where my book begins, and that is where our journey begins tonight. So on Christmas Eve in 1923, the Coolidges participated in several of the events uh, of that tree lighting. At 5 o'clock, they walked to the ellipse, and the president lit the national tree with his foot. He did not give a speech at that time, but uh, there was a choir from the Epiphany Church that led the crowd in Christmas carols. At 7 o'clock, the Marine Band um, put on a concert of holiday music. And then at 9 o'clock, Grace Coolidge had invited 65 members of First Congregational Church, her church, to sing Christmas carols on the steps of the White House. And the Evening Star printed the words of the carols in the order that they would be sung and suggested that this newspaper clipping be, be um, brought and also with a light so that they could 
see the words to the carols and sing along. And the newspaper uh, reported that about 10,000 people came to, uh, the Chris to the White House that first uh, Christmas Eve. Um, and then a few days later, six more thousand people showed up on New Year's uh, Day for that reception. Finally, in 1927, Calvin Coolidge uh, wrote out a Christmas message in longhand. He never did speak at the tree lighting ceremony, but he, he wrote this out and it appeared in major newspapers across the, the nation. And then it came to us, we found it in a garage sale um, in calligraphy. And it says, Christmas is not a time or a season, but a state of mind. To cherish peace and goodwill, to be plenteous in mercy, is to have the real spirit of Christmas. If we think on these things, there will be born in us a savior, and over us all will shine a star, sending its gleam of hope to the world. Franklin Roosevelt's message at the lighting of the National Christmas Tree was much longer, and it read like a, a State of the Union address. Uh, early in his administration, the Roosevelt family would meet together for a three-day festival, and the president would normally dramatize and read uh, Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, and they had a great time. By 1936, world events cast a shadow over their holidays. Christmas cards became simple with this little red barn that um, appears on the president's card from 1936 until 1941. It was in 1941, of course, December 7th, that Pearl Harbor was attacked, and within days, the United States was involved in World War II. Winston Churchill came to the White House and uh, he and the president spoke at the tree lighting ceremony, witnessed by 15 to 20,000 people in 1941. The president gave an appeal for a preparation of Americans' hearts and a proclamation of prayer. Um, Winston Churchill expressed a pleasure in being able to speak to the American people on, the, at the, on Christmas Eve he addressed them as fellow workers in the cause of freedom. After 1941, Christmases uh, weren't very cheerful. Eleanor Roosevelt said that her mother-in-law had passed away. She had four sons in different theaters of the war. The three-day celebration that they once enjoyed never were to be again. And unknown at the time, 1941, would be the last time that President Roosevelt would push the button to light the national Christmas tree in Washington, D.C. Uh, because of the demands of war, the electric lights had to be eliminated. And in fact, in 1943, the Board of Commissioners even recommended that the national tree be abandoned altogether to conserve uh, resources. And it was the First Lady who interceded to save this 20-year tradition. She appealed to the board. She said, unless it is absolutely necessary to abolish the custom, Americans have sacrificed so much, and the ceremony at the National Christmas Tree is the only real holiday that they had left. And so the tree was spared. School children made um, ornaments out of paper and dedicated to a loved one in the war. The lights were eliminated, and after 10 years, the president went back to Hyde Park, and he did continue his messages on Christmas Eve, uh, but it was from Hyde Park. Well, in 1944, the president, who was also a father with four sons in the war, delivered a heartfelt prayer on June 6, 1944, the D-Day prayer. And uh, this year, we've celebrated the 75th anniversary of D-Day, and that prayer was so... Um, incredible that the document, a document was um, given in the form of a scroll to his staff at Christmas time, six months later. It was also uh, made into a book and given to his executive staff and to his family. The 1944 Christmas card read, best wishes for a happier 1945. Well, the war took its toll on President Roosevelt. He longed for lasting peace. He died in April never knowing how uh, close the nation was to uh, peace. Harry Truman had only been vice president for 83 days when 
uh, Roosevelt died, and he became president at a very crucial time. He made the decision about bombing of Hiroshima in Japan. The Trumans moved into um, the White House on May 7th, and the following day was very historic and memorable. It was that day on May 8th that Germany surrendered unconditionally to end uh, the war in Europe. They had a reproduction of the VE Day document that was um, given as a Christmas gift to his staff and to one of his cabinet members. He said, this is a Merry Christmas to you and it's a happy birthday to me because his birthday was, his 61st birthday was on May 8th. The Allied commander of uh, that great war was Dwight Eisenhower. And if ever there was a president who took a, a personal interest in the cards and gifts that were sent from the White House, it was Dwight Eisenhower, who called upon his friend and Christmas card expert, Joyce C. Hall, who was president of Hallmark Cards. When uh, General Eisenhower was president of Columbia University, he took up painting. He didn't think his work was very good. Mr. Hall disagreed and he asked him if he if Hallmark could reproduce some of his paintings to give out as Christmas gifts. So first in 1953, um, Abraham Lincoln became a gift print for his friends and employees. The following year, his gift was um, a painting of George Washington taken after Gilbert Stewart's famous work. Other gifts included the painting of a deserted barn. In 1959, he painted a rocky butte uh, in Canada that was renamed Mount Eisenhower. And his uh, last painting was of a church in Bavaria that he obviously had seen during the war. Well, Mamie Eisenhower loved Christmas. She loved giving cards and gifts all through the year, whether it be birthdays or babies or whatever. And so when I interviewed her social secretary, Mary Jane McCaffrey, she handed me an envelope with 38 Christmas cards that the Eisenhowers had given in eight years. You do the math, that's more than four cards a year. There was, uh, they designed an official White House card, an official um, gift enclosure that went with their gifts, a personal Christmas card, which um, this uh, one of them on the golf cart was. Uh, there was a Mamie Bangs card, that was her signature that was given and even a contemporary card of them in a Santa Claus suit. So the Eisenhowers were credited with the initiating the tradition of presidential Christmas cards as we know them today. They were like a five by seven size, could put through the mail. Uh, their Christmas card list went from 1,000 to 3,000 people. It included a presidential seal on every card with um, the word season's greetings and thus the title of my book, Season's Greetings from the White House. Now in contrast, uh, John F. Kennedy decided not to send Christmas cards. He planned to send telegrams until the CFO told him how much that was going to cost to send them around the world. So Hallmark came to the rescue with a card very similar to the Eisenhower's, a green card with a seal and uh, season's greetings. John F. Kennedy brought a young family to the White House. His gift to his staff that first year was a photo of Caroline's ducks swimming in the White House fountain on the South Lawn. Their second Christmas card was a photo of Caroline's pony, uh, Macaroni, pulling a sleigh with Mrs. Kennedy and um, Caroline and a friend across the South Lawn. Their final Christmas card was also that of a child, the baby Jesus. The photo uh, of the nativity scene that was in the east room of the White House, the crash, had been on loan to the White House and that's what they chose for their 1963 card. Before going to uh, Dallas, the President and First Lady uh, began signing about 30 of the Christmas cards. He signed in black ink, she signed in blue ink and they thought we will finish this later. Well, after the assassination on November 22nd, President Johnson took over. The Kennedy staff left abruptly. The signed cards were thrown in a box and did not resurface again until 1985, 34 years ago. And so it was this 1963 Kennedy Christmas card 
that was signed but never sent is one of the most valuable of all presidential Christmas memorabilia. In May of 1996, my first book was ready to go to print. And I had a call from a friend in Washington, and she said, Mary, I just read this article about a 1963 Johnson Christmas card. This was in May. I said, hmm, a 1963, I, I designated that as the Kennedy card. So I called, um, and I had assigned the 1964 card to Johnson as their first card. It was this black and white rendering of the President's Park. So I called the Johnson Library and I learned that on November 27, 1963, the Chief of Protocol at the State Department sent a me memorandum to the new president. And he says, unless you and Mrs. Johnson prefer not to do so this year, I recommend that you send holiday greeting cards to top government officials, especially any foreign chiefs of staff with whom the United States had a relationship, foreign ministers and heads of governments that President Johnson has personally met. Well, his uh, chief of staff approved the rec recommendation on December 1st and uh, re sent the appropriate lists to uh, the White House. Hallmark, again, came to the rescue and uh, they had just shipped the rest of the crash cards to the White House on November 22nd. And so they were uh, requested again to make an appropriate card of, um, that was appropriate for such a time as this. It was a simple white card with an embossed presidential seal and a red border. I made the correction uh, to the LBJ chapter sent it to the printer in 1996. And um, so the following cards for uh, LBJ uh, were a little bit different. First of all, they changed the manufacture of the print of the Christmas cards from Hallmark to American Greetings. And then they really liked the work of one uh, artist at American Greetings by the name of Robert Lasik. His watercolors appeared on every card in gift print since. And um, this was one uh, in 1967. He did an interior of the Blue Room Christmas tree. In 1968, he did an exterior, which was Mrs. Johnson's favorite view from the White House in spring. Now, what I learned about these two rare Christmas cards was that was the importance of traditions at the White House. The New Year's Day reception lasted 130 years. The lighting of the National Christmas tree was cut back, but it was never closed down. And during the Carter administration, when we had hostages in Iran, only the star at the top was lit. And then last Thursday, President Trump uh, lit the National Christmas tree for the 96th tree lighting ceremony in Washington, D.C. The traditions hold. The tradition of sending official presidential Christmas cards has never been interrupted due to war, due to the death of a president, or a holiday deadline that was late uh, for nearly 90 years, dating back to uh, the small Christmas cards that FDR sent. And speaking of White House traditions, President and Mrs. Nixon introduced a few of their own. The Nixons started the tradition of hosting candlelight tours of the White House their first year, uh, first Christmas in the White House. Pat Nixon loved to decorate. She said, you can never decorate too much at Christmas time. And one of her most unique ideas was having the pastry chef uh, create the first gingerbread house in the president's house. It was a three foot A-frame uh, gingerbread house and that was her signature style while her time there. Now, over the years, the gingerbread house has uh, changed shape. It's gained weight, and, uh, but the idea and the tradition stemmed back 50 years to Pat Nixon. Now, President Nixon added his personal touch uh, with gifts featuring five presidents that he gave away to his White House staff as their Christmas gifts. And each president came in a velour commemorative folder, either red or white or blue or green. It was followed by a parchment page 
that describe the portraits of the presidents Washington, Jefferson, Lincoln, Theodore Roosevelt, and James Monroe. Each had a brass light plate that identified the president. They're a little bit hard to frame, but um, that was what he chose. It was, and this collection has great significance to my husband and I, because uh, Ron was at a medical meeting in Washington, D.C., and uh, he went out looking for a donut or trouble or something, and uh, <laughs> he went into this political memorabilia shop, and the first purchase that he made was a President Nixon uh, red velour folder of George Washington. And so that um, purchase has changed our life these past 30 years. Well, Gerald Ford went to Washington first as a senior in high school, and then he returned as your representative of Michigan's fifth congressional district during the Truman era. He served as the 40th vice president and became the 38th president on August 9, 1974. Gerald Ford had served in Congress for 25 years and was very familiar with the political life in Washington. And Mrs. Ford told me, he said, she said, his dedication to the country rubbed off on me. And so her desire during her time at the White House was to depict an American theme and portray American arts and crafts. Now, preparing for Christmas would be a challenge for any administration, but especially if you came into the office at the end of summer. Despite the turmoil of Watergate, plus major surgery for the First uh, Lady in September, Betty Ford's outlook was very courageous. The Fords had attended many White House uh, parties, and so they were familiar with what went on at Christmas time, and this was to their great advantage. Mrs. Ford also had a wonderful staff to assist her. She could rely upon them, she could learn from them. And so in November, they came to her and said, now, what do you want us to share about you at Christmas? And she said, well, for many years, our family always enjoys going together and skiing um, in the mountains of Colorado, and so snow was a key factor that brought them much joy at Christmas time. So the staff, creative staff, uh, gathered winter snow scenes of America from the White House collection, and so it was no surprise that the Fords chose gift prints depicting snow. In fact, they chose a snow scene for every year by the same artist, George Dury. Uh, in 1974, their gift to their staff was this New England snow scene by George Dury. In nec the next year, their official Christmas card was Farmyard by George Dury. And in 1976, their Christmas card featured George Dury's native Connecticut entitled Going to Church. And so that completed their trio of snow scenes. Now, decorating the White House for Christmas emphasized simplic simplicity and thrift amidst a recession that was going on. Mrs. Ford chose an old-fashioned, handmade theme. Patchwork ornaments were made by various uh, craft groups. And even Susan Ford went to her sewing basket and got out some scraps and made some um, patchwork ornaments as well. And then they also printed a little brochure where we at home could also make um, uh, patchwork ornaments uh, for our tree during this time of thrift. Well, while the White House looked very festive at Christmas time, Mrs. Ford thought, this is a great time to entertain. I want to make our time here fun. You know, the country is in need of that. We've gone through... Um, a uh, traumatic, difficult time, let's have some fun. So the Ford started a new tradition, and they hosted the first annual Christmas ball for the cabinet and members of Congress. The Black Tie Gala was held right after the tree lighting ceremony. They dispensed with protocol. The 900 guests included both sides of the aisle because uh, Jerry Ford had 
had worked with these men and women throughout his 25 years in Congress. It was very lighthearted, she said. It was healthy. It was fun for all of us. Well, Betty Ford loved the Christmas of 1975. That would be her favorite, getting ready for the bicentennial uh, and getting people in the spirit for July of 1976. So she and her team started early. They made several trips to Williamsburg to get ideas. The theme was early Americana. Uh, they decorated the White House with natural materials such as leaves, pomegranates, red pepper pods, pine cones, acorns, dried fruits, and, and flowers replaced sequins and glitter, preserving a theme steeped in heritage and tradition. She said, I loved every minute that I was there. She said, the bicentennial was, was a, a wonderful, historically exciting time in our history. And she said, looking back, I can I remember that it was very demanding, but very interesting. She described it as a revolving door of heads of state that came and left. One left and the next um, official arrived. She said, I never expected to meet so many heads of state, emperors. The Shah of Iran came to pay respect to our country. The Queen's visit on the actual celebration was icing on the cake. Well, my favorite story coming out of the bicentennial was a story about the art that was reproduced uh, as a gift for President and Mrs. Ford that they gave at Christmas of 1976. It was entitled uh, Philadelphia 1858. And the history of this piece is very fascinating. I shared some of the details with uh, Mrs. Ford. They were unknown to her. And I'm only going to give you just a brief history. You can read about it on page 140 of my book. <laughs> the art was painted uh, by an Englishman in, while he was in America. He finished it in England, sold it to an art collector from India. When uh, this Indian's estate was eventually liquidated, a New York antique dealer by the name of Albert Nestle recognized this piece, this art. It was rolled up on a dirt floor, and he described it to the White House courier as in shocking condition. But he recognized the, the, the people, the background. It must be colonial America. So he bought it. He paid $7, and he shipped it back to the United States. He shipped it to uh, New York with the rest of his purchases. And when he returned upon closer inspection, he decided, you know, it's going to be very costly to restore. So he sold it to the Kennedy Galleries for a modest figure. And months later, there was an article and a picture of it in Antique Magazine, and it was declared a great discovery. And so Mr. Nestle felt, well, at least I rescued it from the junk pile in India. Today, that $7 painting hangs in the green room of the White House. Mr. Conger, who told me this story, said, it is considered the greatest bargain in American paintings in the history of the world. It's a great story, page 140. So every time I go to the White House and I go into the green room, uh, I think of that wonderful rescue and the story, which is really one of my favorites in all the book. The Carters also used historical prints for their Christmas cards. They, the, the Christmas card in their gift print now was the same, large and small. And uh, this one is entitled um, The President's House by Cranstone. It was uh, given out in 1979. And over the years, there was a greater need for Christmas cards. Uh, during the Kennedy-Johnson um, years, they sent out about two to 3,000. Uh, during the Ford-Nixon years, it was 40 to 60,000. And then, during the Carter years, it escalated significantly, doubled. Because Mrs. Carter, wanted to do something for all of the people who campaigned and worked hard for the president. And so she thought sending them a Christmas card 
would be like giving them a thank you for your support and for all your work. People love getting a card from the President of the United States, and they were happy to oblige. And so she sent them an official Christmas card. And so the numbers went to 120,000 cards in, with this print in uh, 1980. Now, Nancy Reagan, she decided that she was going to invite young American artists to paint a scene or a room in, in the White House for their Christmas card. Jamie Wyeth was the first artist. He was a third generation artist. He was the first one to get the invite to come and, uh, and paint a, a room in the White House. But he didn't want to paint a room like Thomas William Jones, who painted four rooms in the White House from 1985 to, uh, to 88. In fact, uh, he also painted the cover of my book when I wanted to have it changed. Well, Jamie Wyeth came to the White House to get inspired, and he was uh, allowed to do whatever he wanted to do, and, which is very freeing for an artist to not be, you know, uh, so tied into uh, something specific. And what he saw was that the executive mansion was more than a museum. It was the president's home. We tend to forget that the first family actually lives there. And they prepare for Christmas late at night, just as we do. And so he decided to be instructive and do something different, to symbolize by a single light that this is Christmas Eve at the White House. So during the summer, he literally sat out on the lawn. He began to sketch the White House under and put it under a blanket of snow and a starry sky. The light shone from just one room in the White House. And then his brush, he cast a spell of indigo over it all, and it took Hallmark eight separations to get the, the color right uh, with the dark purple. When he showed it to the Reagans, she got it. She said, it looks like everyone else has gone to bed on Christmas Eve, and there I am wrapping president, presents and doing the things that we all do on Christmas Eve. Well, three years later, he came back and he painted another exterior, Christmas morning, which features, and you, you can't really see them, you just have to kind of imagine that there are tiny squirrel um, steps, footprints, going up to the North Portico. I never liked that card. And I told Ron, we don't need too many of those, don't buy them. <laughs> Until I talked to Mrs. Reagan. And the story that she told me about President Reagan and the squirrels was very endearing. And so um, I, I love that card now. That's on page 167. <laughs> now, animals and pets have always found a place um, at Christmas in the White House. Barbara Bush, when she went to, um, when they went to the White House, she invited an interior designer by the name of Mark Hampton to help her freshen up the residence and uh, redecorate the president's office. President Herbert Walker Bush knew exactly what he wanted. He wanted a new blue rug with a gold seal. And so Hamilton, uh, or Hampton installed new curtains. He recovered some chairs. He changed the sofa. And he gave the president his new blue rug. Now, when he was finished, he presented a watercolor of the room, complete with a Christmas tree covered with cookies that their personal um, housekeeper makes so the president could hand out Christmas cookies when someone visits him in the Oval Office. And the first family um, had asked him if he would uh, make a drawing for them so that they could use it for a Christmas card of the Oval Office. And Barbara Bush knew what she liked, too. By the way, on the day before Thanksgiving, 1995, I picked up the phone, and the voice said, may I speak to Mary Seeley? This is Barbara Bush. Her secretary wouldn't give me an interview, but um, Barbara Bush checked, wanted to check it off of her list of things to do. And uh, so she told me that you know, Mark sent us this most marvelous painting for us to approve, and there in the middle of the rug was Millie sprawled out, <laughs> resting. And George felt, and I did too, 
that when you send Christmas greetings to kings and queens, you don't want a dog in the picture. <laughs> and so he was asked to paint another uh, rendering of that Oval Office. And when I spoke at the Bush Library, I just had to see that picture of Millie on the rug, uh, and they had both of them in their private quarters in the Bush Library. Well, the Clintons made a significant change to Christmas card art. Mrs. Clinton uh, wanted to also showcase the house, but she was partial to a contemporary artist by the name of Thomas McKnight. They owned one of his paintings, they loved his work, so they invited him to paint the Red Room in 1994 for uh, their Christmas card. They had posed the year before, kind of getting a late start, they posed themselves in the state dining room with uh, some Christmas decorations. Now, Thomas McKnight has a very recognizable style, in incorporating things like you would read in Goodnight Moon. Uh, in each of his paintings, he also took artistic license and moved things around. He skewed the Washington Monument and uh, the Jefferson Memorial to be seen out of the window. He replaced 19th century paintings with a portrayal of himself with his wife's dog walking along the rolling hills of Middletown. <laughs> and above the fire he placed, he made a fanciful image of the White House. Now, traditionally, there had never been a Christmas tree in the Red Room, but he added one. And under it, he put a new saxophone for the president, a sled for Chelsea. And on the side table, he placed a tea set for Mrs. Clinton. Under the chair, he caught socks napping and uh, hung three stockings by the fireplace with care. His art was reproduced on 250,000 Christmas cards. Now, one tends to think of the White House as being a traditional home, but McKnight's work was creative and contemporary, and uh, the next year he painted the Blue Room, followed by the Green Room. You see, each administration uh, makes personal choices that are unique and interesting and um, really indicative of who they are. I think one of the most interesting stories about an artist who painted for the president was the story of Adrian Martinez, and I interviewed about 22 artists. As a child, he grew up in a neighborhood uh, just a few blocks from the White House. He told me, I was a walking kid, and I must have walked past that house 10,000 times and he had memories of large black cars going through those imposing iron gates at the White House. He lived near the National uh, Gallery of Art and the Smithsonian. They became his second home, so he had developed a love of, of art. It got him a job in Texas, and there he learned to paint. Well, fast forward to 2001. Mrs. Bush, Laura Bush, uh, knew about his artistic abilities. One of his paintings hung in the governor's mansion where they lived in Texas. The Bushes bought it for their ranch, and so Mrs. Bush asked him to return to Washington to paint their first Christmas card. And she said, he almost wept when I first met him. Here he was in this beautiful house to create a painting for the President of the United States. Mrs. Bush didn't give him any guidelines. She had confidence in his abilities. And all the time, he kept thinking about going back to his roots, the days of his non-affluent childhood, the memories of him being on the outside. And he recalled now riding in a black, big black car, going through those imposing gates to meet the First Lady. It was very emotional for him. The mystery was gone. Here he was on the inside rather than looking from the outside. And he was treated with respect. Only in America could such a dream come true. Well, George and Laura Bush loved his work. They added a personal sentiment and a scripture that had special meaning after 9-1-1. Now, scripture had become the Bush's signature touch. This was not a knee-jerk to 911. They had added scriptures when, President, when Governor Bush was in Texas, 
and they continued that tradition as president in the White House. So in 2004, the Bushes had um, a bid for re-election, and like Mrs. Carter, there were more Christmas cards than ever that were needed to thank the supporters. Hallmark printed more than two million Christmas cards and 11,000 gift prints in 2004. By the end of their administration in 2008, it went down to about 1.2 million. But to my knowledge, presidential Christmas cards had reached their peak with 2 million. Now, to reinforce the importance of presidential Christmas cards was a case in point during the Obama's first term. They had this very beautiful, uh, formal, eloquent uh, Christmas card design with a gold embossed presidential seal on the front. And Portico, uh, Politico, I'm sorry, made a note of uh, the, a problem that they had, that they didn't print enough cards. They reported that a number of Obama's um, major donors were upset because they didn't get a Christmas card uh, that first year. And so the person responsible for the Christmas card project was relieved of her position. Another um, change that was noted with the Obamas was the traditional gift print that had been given to their staff since the Hoover administration. Every year they would give a frameable large gift print, is what we call it, uh, that they could hang on their wall. But with the Obamas, six of the eight years, the gift print was missing. Now, traditions can be broken, and the decision for change are the prerogative of every administration. Now, while Barbara and George Bush decided not to include a dog on their Christmas cards, Barack and Michelle Obama decided to include their pets on five of their eight Christmas cards. In fact, in 2012, Michelle Obama held a nationwide art contest 80 artists competed for the prize of creating an art for the Obama's Christmas card. And so Larissa Cabell of Des Moines, Iowa, designed this winning image, a bow wrapped with a festive scarf romping through new fallen snow on the south lawn with the White House in the distance. This bodacious card was sent to members of Congress, government officials, governors, ambassadors, heads of state around the world, political supporters, family, and friends. Christmas at the White House reflects the personal preference of the first family. There's no right or wrong. The Obamas loved their bow, and Mrs. Obama was quoted as saying, he is the most important member of the family, and the president knows it. <laughs> well, Donald Trump preferred Merry Christmas over Happy Holidays. In fact, as candidate Trump, he campaigned on bringing back the beautiful phrase, Merry Christmas. He says, people don't say it anymore. It's always happy holidays. I love Christmas. And if I'm elected, you are going to hear and say Merry Christmas again. And sure enough, as president, Donald Trump turned the holiday card into a Merry Christmas card inside of of his eloquent embossed white and gold card was a simple message, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And their commemorative gift with a gold foil embossed seal of the president incorporated the same element as their Christmas card. Not since George and Barbara Bush had there been a reference to Christmas on the official card. It was always a holiday card. Well, at the lighting of the National Christmas Tree on November 30th, 2017, President Trump said, today's the day I have been very much looking forward to all year long. It is one that we have heard and we speak about and we dream about, and now as President of the United States, it is my tremendous honor to finally wish America and the world a very Merry Christmas. He repeated the greeting on his Christmas Day pre-recorded message, and uh, he closed by saying, on behalf of Melania, myself, Darren, and the entire Trump family, 
God bless you. God bless America, and have a very, very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Their um, last year's card, it was a rich green and gold card, bore the same sentiment, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And this year, with a flag on their card and their gift print, I suspect it has not changed. And so Ron and I wish you the same. A very, very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. We thank you for coming out on this evening to hear my story about nearly a century of Christmases at the White House. Thank you. Uh, this was last year's 2018. Uh, there, it was a red and green. It was the year when people talked about the red Christmas tree. You know, it was last year's. And uh, this is the cross hall um, in the entry to the White House. Is that what your question was? Anyone else? Yes. I'm trying to think of the times that we've been there. It doesn't often, you know, it doesn't always snow at uh, in Washington, D.C., but yes, there are times when they do have a, a dusting of snow, maybe not a snowstorm at Christmas time, but it makes it quite festive. What? Well, there is the White House historical official ornament that has been uh, going on since 1981, starting with Nancy Reagan. But um, I don't know about all of them. I know that Mrs. Bush uh, had balls made that were that she gave as gifts, personal gifts. In fact, she invited me to. I make ornaments as well, and she invited me to uh, design a, a Christmas ball for her one year and told me to do it in lime green. We thought we knew better, so we made it in a beautiful uh, green, and we lost. We came in second, you know? The, the lime green won. So. <laughs> anyway, do what the first lady says. Now, this year with, um, with the Trumps, their first year, this, the, they've done it for three years now, they have made their official family ornament. They only make about 200 of them. Uh, they're very beautiful. Um, they're hard to come by, and they're given to, you know, family or have to be close to, the, to, to them, maybe executive staff. I, I don't know, but they have a tree. When you go through the White House, you can see it's all covered with just that one ornament. So uh, we're told that they make 200 of them, and they're, they're quite lovely. What kind of a break do the, uh, like the Trumps, do they get any kind of like a Christmas celebration or a New Year's Eve celebration, that type of thing, New Year's Day celebration? Do they have anything? Not New Year's Day. They're in Mar-a-Lago for Christmas. Um, I'm not exactly sure when they leave. Uh, but they, they are in Mar-a-Lago because I've seen pictures of New Year's, but at Mar-a-Lago. The New Year's Day reception is quite interesting that they carried that on for 130 years. You show us all these Christmas trees and things. Do they have any religious specific items up there or no? In the um, East Room of the White House, it was during the Kennedy administration a creche was loaned to the White House, and that's why uh, the, Mrs. Kennedy chose the nativity scene, the creche, for their 1963 Christmas card. It was the first year that they did that. Then with the Johnsons, they, someone donated um, a creche, a permanent creche, and um, it was 
it's in the White House every, every year. Um, so it, it is quite large and you know, it's, it's very nice in the East Room always. Um, other than that, and then the scripture that the Bushes chose to put on their Christmas cards are the religious aspects that I can recall. Yes. Of, of all the different interviews that you did, what would be the most unique thing that you learned from the interviews? Well, Nancy Reagan was the first one that I had. So um, I worked with the curator at the White House, Rex Scouten, and uh, he was very, very helpful to us. And so he set up that first interview. All of my interviews were by telephone, which I appreciated because I always asked them, can I tape this? I'm, it's very important to me to be accurate, and I don't want to tell you what I think they said. I want to report their actual words. And so Nancy Reagan was the first one, so I appreciated that. And Mr. Uh, Scouten had said, it's okay to talk to her, you know. Um, probably my, um, the one I'll never forget is Barbara Bush calling me. You know, because I had asked her social secretary, can I, I'd like to interview her. She's so busy, she travels a lot, she probably will not be able to talk to you. So when she called, and of course I recognized her voice, um, it was unexpected, but, um, and I didn't really learn a lot because what I do is I read her book and I go to all of the, you know, the holiday things and planning and all of that. She didn't maybe tell me too much new, but it was in her words. And so it's very important that I talk to as many uh, first ladies as I could. Now, when I talked to Mrs. Ford, um, I was a little embarrassed because she just wanted to keep talking. And I, I thought, well, I don't want to take up your time. You're the first lady. And I, um, you know, she was not in office you know, at the time. It was later. But I thought, I've ans you've answered my, all my questions. And thank you for your time. But she just kept asking questions. And I ended up sending her some of the Christmas prints that she didn't have for her family. and. We had a nice visit, but I was a little, I thought, but she just kept leading on, so I kept listening and talking to her, which was fun. Um, I, I think those are, those are key. It, it was very important, and I didn't start doing any interviews until I had done all my homework. I mean, like I said, I'm a farm girl from Wisconsin, I'm not, I'm, pretty shy normally. And so I wanted to make sure that I knew what I was talking about before I uh, interviewed any first lady. Now, what is neat is I have all of those interviews on tape. And so that's pretty special. Yeah. How did you get started in this, in this type of uh, uh, thing where you were you know, finding out about Christmas at the White House? What kind of initiated that with you? You should be talking to the man right next to you, my husband. Uh, he's a doctor, and uh, he was at a medical meeting in Washington, D.C., working on goose eyes. And uh, he finished all of his um, work, so he went out walking down Connecticut Avenue and came into a political memorabilia shop. And he asked them, do you have anything, this was in May, do you have anything that pertains to Christmas? And the proprietor went in the back, and he came out with the Christmas card from uh, Nixon. And uh, so we have become you know, great friends over the years. And so um, he started collecting. And some collections he bought a lot of, we almost committed him to. <laughs> we wondered, where are you going with this? <laughs> so then one day, he had a slow time at the office, and he called the White House. He wanted to talk to the courier. And, um, so actually, the creator called him back, invited us to come. We w met with Mr. Scouten about 24 different times. He was very helpful, you know, to us. And, and it, you know, he lined up things that I could never have done on my own. So I couldn't have done it without Rex Scouten. And uh, so we asked him questions. There were some cards that don't have a date on it and things. And... Uh, 
he was frustrated that, you know, he didn't have the answers, and so he said, you know, someone needs to do the research and set the record straight. And so my husband offered me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm a history major. I've never written a book. And we didn't set out to write a book. We set out to uh, research what did we have. And then it just kept going. And I, I do like research. And here we are, eighth edition. Yes. Oh, the Eisenhower, probably. I think Mamie Eisenhower had like 52. She liked Christmas, and they could be in the utility room in any place. But I haven't counted, you know, but I know that Mamie Eisenhower had 52. So that's a lot. Well, I know that England, you know, has, I, I guess I wanted to get a Christmas card of, of Diana. Um, that's the only one we have seen. We don't have one, do we? No. No. Um, but I, I have not done international Christmas cards. I think that more people of internationals are interested in what America does as the president than we are, you know, unfortunately, of what China might do or something like that. Yes? Um, I know that when government affairs can provide people with material for ballpark uh -huh. and stuff, uh -huh. so have you done that every year? I'm not a government or employee, but yes, we have, not every year, um, we started in the George W. Bush years, and, or did he go to Reagan? No, I, I, I can't remember, but we have on occasion, uh, I was in the White House the year that it was uh, canceled in 2011, but I had worked it out that I could come in and see the decoration. I walked in these rooms by myself there was no one else in there. And there were, they didn't cancel the music group. So there was a choir from, you know, a, a chorus from some school or church or something that was singing in the East Room. But I was there by myself. And there were a few other people, uh, you know, that had gotten in too. Uh, usually I go through the social secretaries or um, Mr. Stoughton, you know, would get me in or, you know, any way I can get in. The congressman, I've used the congressman one year. <coughs> they have tickets. Uh, Senator Kirsten has said that since they didn't see it for the news show, it was probably in 2004 or 2005. We, we were just at the doorstep to do the White House. Yeah. And so we, we got to go and check it out. We, we love to go. Last year we were there. <laughs> and... Um, they had to shoo us out because the White House was closing at 8 o'clock or so because we, we love to be there and uh, we take pictures and we go through once and we kind of head back and take more pictures and it's a wonderful thing to do if you can do it. We will miss it this year, but our daughter is going on uh, the 13th for her birthday. She got tickets and we'll see her pictures. Yes. Oh. No, there is a contest among tree growers that, um, you know, they bring in, these are real trees. I have artificial trees at home because I decorate in October, but um, <laughs> in the White House, they're real trees, and they have a contest for the Tree Growers Association, and they could come in from Wisconsin or Colorado or Pennsylvania or, di you know, different, and I don't know about the um, variety of evergreen that they bring in. I'm, I don't know that. Yes. Do you know what the last year of the Bush administration for the Tree Growers Association um, was? Do you know? Well, uh, 
one of the last, the last piece, I think, that Ron bought was um, Chester A. Arthur is a very, um, he didn't do a lot of uh, written things, signed things, it's very rare. And we have a letter from Chester A. Arthur, which a collector said was, was really good, but he just bought a recent one of a check that was written to myself on Christmas Eve during his administration. That's, that was his last thing. It's not my favorite thing. Um, I don't know what my favorite is. Yeah, I think Ron's um, favorite artifact is uh, we have a Abraham Lincoln uh, telegram that was um, sent to um, Well, it was instructing the people at this prison to release a certain young man to his parents on Christmas Eve. And we love that piece because it shows the heart of the president. First of all, um, this father and mother, or this father was also an attorney and they were kind of on opposing sides. And uh, so for him to go out of his way to release this young man and send him home to his parents for Christmas uh, from Lookout Point uh, Prison, which had very bad, you know, um, conditions. Uh, it, we, just, we just thought this is really very, hum uh, showed his humanity. So we like that. And we have our earliest piece goes back to James Madison and we don't have everything from James Madison, but from Coolidge forward, we, we do have every year. But we always learn of something new. Yeah. Last question. Okay. Um, I don't think any of the White House, but on the ellipse during the tree lighting ceremony, there was a time, I think during the Nixon administration, when they had live nativity, but it was around that period of administrations that they did have live nativity, and then it was abolished. It could have been with Ford or Nixon, it seems to me it was in that period of time. But the White House as such does not have a live nativity. Was that your question? Pardon? I didn't hear that comment. like a wooden one or anything yeah, like yeah, that? Yeah. Not to my knowledge. Never say never. I invite you to enjoy the reception following um, Mary will be out to sign her book and